going on from those uh, English uh, and uh, Scottish and Irish uh, talks that have already been given, there will inevitably, and I do apologise for this in advance, there will inevitably be a certain amount of duplication, uh, simply because obviously when you're looking at UK legislation, you're looking at certain guidelines that have been set, then there's a different limited number of ways in which one can, uh, in which one can follow on. And so there will be a certain amount of duplication there. Um, so if we look at sectoral adaptation plans, um, this is the uh, Welsh Government 2010 response to the UK Climate Change Act of 2008. Uh, a major feature of our adapta adaptation framework will be the preparation of key sectoral adaptation plans for Wales. A heritage sector adaptation plan was not considered at that point as part of it, um, but it has since subsequently uh, come, come into the equation. The definition of a sectoral adaptation plan is simply a plan relating to a specific sector which aims to adapt to or reduce the effect of the climate on human activity in the natural world. Uh, and on, I'll be concentrating to a large extent on the impacts of coastal erosion. Uh, Tom, with his mapping in the second part of it, will look a bit wider uh, at other aspects as well. There's a slight difference, I feel, in the terms mitigation and adaptation in the way that archaeologists have traditionally used them. So as regards mitigation, when we talk about climate change, it's always tackling the underlying causes of climate change, uh, what actually causes them and what we can do to prevent those causes, whereas the adaptation is quite often what archaeologists, I think, would call mitigation. The adaptation is tackling the consequences of, uh, of climate change, and it's always worth remembering that when reading through the, uh, through the literature. And the strategy and guidelines, national adaptation strategy and guidelines, lead to sector adaptation plans, but of course other organisational plans as well. So of all organisations, whether they be private companies, local authorities, whoever they are, are in theory uh, supposed to be producing their own um, uh, adaptation plans. If we look at what's happening in Wales, uh, in 2010, in response to the UK Climate Change Act of 2008, Wales um, produced the climate change strategy and have subsequently this year brought out a five-stage process uh, of how that will be undertaken. There's part one up at the top right there. Uh, and they've appointed a climate change commission which oversees the work and monitors Welsh Government progress on strategy and, and adaptation framework. And of course these things, as the point has already been made, rise quite heavily within, within public perception whenever anything happens and the, the two bottom ones left and right show uh, the storms last year at, uh, at Aberystwyth uh, and the, uh, the problems that occurred there. It's set against a background of quite long term work, certainly the coastal erosion side of it is. Um, I mean, it's always been known that we've been suffering from coastal erosion of course and during the 1990s right around the UK coast uh, there were a series of uh, surveys that were undertaken. The Welsh Archaeological Trust covered all of Wales and it culminated in the publication of the Coastal Archaeology of Wales and the summation of the work. And that was followed on by a whole series of detailed thematic surveys of, uh, in this instance, fish weirs, with the fish being trapped on the ebb tide in the hook there, uh, in those, uh, those, those, those weirs on the coast. Uh, and then more recently, We've also been running a programme throughout Wales called Adonthir, which is where you're trying to get the local communities to join in and help record the, uh, the eroding coastline. Of course, it matches escape in Scotland, uh, and, um, and, and there's a similar one on the Thames as well in London, uh, and I'm sure elsewhere. <coughs> uh, and here we've just been using the public, either training them in recording the buildings on the, on the left there, being recorded, the boat on the upper right, uh, or uh, looking at fines that have been uh, brought to our attention by the public whilst we've been uh, walking the coast. The Historic Environment Group in Wales is a group which uh, supports and advises CADU uh, and it's, um, it's cross-organisational. It's been mentioned by Gwilym and others from CADU uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, there's a subgroup, climate change subgroup, which Tom, Tom and myself uh, sit on uh, and they commissioned uh, an impact assessment report with the aim of identifying the strategic approach for assessing the potential impact of climate change on the historic environment of Wales. And that's downloadable from the, uh, from the kind of website. The objectives were to identify and assess the sensitivity of historic assets to climate change, 
and reduce the risk assessment for historic assets based upon sensitivity to change, uh, including judgments on the likelihood and impacts of the risk identified. And this is very similar to, to work that's been done elsewhere, um, and largely, of course, um, through the IPCC uh, guidelines. There are four major changes and eight sub-changes identified there. Uh, and then down the side, there's a series of 12 archaeological arenas, if you like, or environmental settings, uh, those areas where the impact is likely to be uh, greatest. Uh, and then by using the matrix, it's a question of whether it's high negative, medium negative, low negative, or positive uh, even. And you can, obviously, you can quite easily see that the historic assets below the one meter cons are going to be uh, highly, the, the impact will be highly negative uh, with rise in, uh, in sea level. If we look at the historic assets below the one meter console, within Wales there's a 0 0.4, 0 0.35 to 0 0.4 meter rise suggested by 2018. Obviously there is wide variation, the point's been made in Ireland, there's huge dramatic variation in projections. We don't know exactly where it's going to be. But almost certainly there are going to be significant storm surges, those surges, they will have a huge impact, uh, a very serious threat to those uh, within the north to one meter um, height, uh, monuments, buildings, archaeological sites. Um, we're only looking at, uh, remember here, at those below the one meter contour when we look at nine sands. Uh, that's not all those that are affected by uh, climate change, just simply those sands that lie within that one meter contour, so there are nine. 77 listed buildings. But of course, the major threat is to those historic landscapes, and it's very difficult to judge that uh, from the information that we've got available at the moment. Uh, so, from sea level rise, certainly the foreshore, coastal edge, those high drift cliffs uh, with uh, hill ports, with promontory ports, whatever on top, all sorts of things. Uh, and the sand dunes, dynamic change, retreat and reshape there. Um, there are a number of environments that are going to be impacted upon. And we've got to think also about the impact from those protective works that might be undertaken, uh, or the remedial works that might be undertaken to cope with that. The five-stage process in undertaking an adaptation plan, as recommended by the Welsh Government, uh, is there. That's uh, also very uh, that's available for download from the Welsh Government website. Um, we're roughly in the borderline between we're looking at the investigating phase at the moment. We're really only in part two, perhaps just thinking about part three. Uh, and not, not, uh, not got beyond that. No resources, or very, very minimal resources, have been put into this uh, to date. If we look at adaptation options, these have been discussed already, of course, the historic assets below one metre. Understanding and knowledge is one of the first things, and obviously we can't afford to go out there and carry out all the surveys all over again, so we use GIS survey using existing national and regional records, identify the significance of those sites and landscapes, assess the potential for survival and change conditions, and the potential impact on the character of urban rural landscapes, potential for protection, potential for moving from threat, manage the retreat either to retain the character or acknowledge that are necessary in change and this is where Neil's positive bit comes in, uh, much more positive than, uh, than I think we've been thinking and so really good to hear that actually, um, sort of uh, not just accept it and, and go with it but actually say okay how can we take advantage of it uh, and then uh, and, and survey and record, we've heard last one, you know, is preservation by record really something that, how helpful is that nowadays? Uh, are we are we struggling against it? Um, this is from a colleague, Jill Werpeather, uh, Jill Fowler, sorry, uh, in Cadu. Um, storm damage. This is adaptation options for historic buildings, which again have been looked at slightly. Um, identify assets most at risk. Yet again, develop and promote building maintenance regimes. Storm damage, flooding. Just these sort of things that we need to need to adapt to. Encourage innovative design to take into account potential flooding risk. That can only be new design, of course. Develop and disseminate guidance on adaptive measures to increase resilience and the, the impact of cleanup operation and long-term effects of flooding. This is only a small part of the work that Jill has been doing, but she makes the point that we've got to disseminate guidance on cleanup operations, post-flood monitoring, etc. If we look very briefly at one case, 
uh, Fairborn in Gwynedd lies at 0.35 metres. That lies within that risk, very heavy risk factor before 2080. Um, it's a, a small settlement. Uh, it was developed in the 1890s by McDougall's and McDougall Flower as a, as a potential holiday resort uh, and watering hole next door to Barmouth. Uh, that's the left-hand one is the 1900 OS map. Uh, the settlement only just about getting underway and starting, but there's a red line up there which uh, shows a scheduled ancient monument over a mile long. Uh, and then the red dots on the other one are the HER sites but they're all, there's nothing, nothing else scheduled or listed within it. This is the sand, the Shedu Ancient Monument. It's a tank, tank trap uh, right around on the beach, and say over a mile long, concrete pillars, uh, and, uh, and a lookout. One of the best examples that's uh, uh, preserved uh, within the country. It is vulnerable to damage on the right, near this lower right. You can see how they've all been pushed out of alignment, uh, and quite what one does about it, uh, we don't know. Uh, it's, it's a tricky one. Typically, of course, recording is the first thing that springs to people's minds. And yes, I we can go and record them all, uh, but really, what good? Uh, what good does that do? Have we got a pretty good record of it uh, already? If we look at the buildings themselves, there are three three major building types within the settlement. Uh, the first ones that were built under McDougall's uh, influence uh, are these quite fine terraces, uh, and there's a few of those uh, still left. Uh, there's some nice between the walls bungalows that infill some of the areas. Uh, and then there's a lot of 1970s and later housing, which is very low standard, or seems, uh, if you have the face of it, to be pretty low standard, and does very little for the character uh, of, the, of the area. And this is captured, perhaps, in these two uh, descriptions. First, from the Kentucky Companion Guide to North Wales, which was written in the 1960s by two architects. Uh, on the southern side of the map of the Mallow Estuary, there are huge dunes on which sandy, exceedingly, exceedingly respectable resort of Fairborn. And on the edge of the last sandy beach, concrete dragon's teeth still await the arrival of the Germans. The latest Pesner Guide, uh, Fairborn, a holiday settlement on June, founded in 1895, nothing to recommend it architecturally. <laughs> <laughs> they really couldn't see anything. And I have to admit that there isn't. Uh, down below, you can see the two images of how so buildings are changed. Uh, and, and, it's the same building, and there's still some primary elements are still there, but within the landscape itself, it's difficult to find it it's terribly aesthetically pleasing. The uh, risk assessment taken from the shoreline management plan, uh, huge, you know, there's a terrific amount of work, of course, gone on with the shoreline management plan. There are significant concerns over the medium to long term sustainability of the defence of Fairborn. The defence is a gravel bank. That's essentially what the settlement is behind. A crawl when it's called. It's a gravel bank that runs along the edge of the beach. Uh, and the tank traps are built onto that gravel bank. There's a need to maintain existing defences and reduce flood risk in the short term. The intent of the plan is to move away from defence with consequential need for relocation. There is little or no opportunity for adaptation in terms of defence of We look at the significance. There is a single SAM, which is of national significance. The holiday resort, which I would suggest is of regional or local significance, depending on the German look at it. I think it's an interesting example by McDougall's. Started off actually by another chap called Solomon Andrews, who worked in Portelli and other areas and was responsible for the creation of holiday resorts. So it's got, it fits into a, a very definite historical pattern. And there's a railway there, which I haven't mentioned as yet, for those uh, interested in railways, which is a, one could say just about a regional significance. So adaptation, Sam and the railway. The, 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 the ancient monument and the railway. Can they preserve by record? Possibly relocation? Possibly for bits of it, not for the whole mile and a half of tank traps, I don't think. But who knows? It can be, if the settlement is relocated further inland behind another defence, which is what's being suggested, is it really feasible to move the, uh, the tank traps there as well? Uh, and the holiday resort preserved by record. Characterisation study, level one, two, three of record properties. And really it's difficult to. Uh, difficult to think much much beyond that, I think, although I quite like Neil's suggestion of perhaps, I don't know, some way of ceremonially destructing it, I didn't say. <laughs> <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Tom now, who's going to talk to you about the mapping process that's being undertaken to accompany this work. Um, yes, I'll just be quickly on. Um, so, 
we uh, have done some work recently on, on a spatial approach to capturing the, uh, the potential risks to historic environment sites um, as a result of climate change. It's not new work. We started looking at this back in 2009, um, and really the only difference is that more recently we've decided to use enhanced data sets as a means of better capturing the, the, the sites that may be at risk. So we started back in 2009. <coughs> But um, for the uh, Historic Environment Group Climate Change subgroup, we decided to pilot a new approach looking at a pilot study area just slightly to the south of where um, Andrew's just been describing the, the delightful Fairbourne, and moving slightly south and, and taking in the W estuary and Aberystwyth. Uh, and again, that's the, that's the area. Um, so in 2009, when we ran the process, we modeled the whole of Wales using radar captured surface data and uh, captured sites topographically against that data set. So when we were looking at sites below the one meter contour, <coughs> we were using a data set that gave us a, a, a measurement on a five meter post spacing, so the, the height of reading every five meters, and with a positive or negative uh, vertical accuracy of 70 centimeters, which when you're trying to record a site that might be below one meter, so it could be those centimeters all. One meter seventy, you know, so it's not accurate enough, not fit for purpose, really. Um, when you zoom in, you can see this is a digital terrain model, so surface features are uh, uh, stripped away. Um, you can see there's, you can see the topography, you can see the lines of um, a railway track there, but there's not a lot of detail. When we bring in um, uh, lidar data, we uh, we obtain from the Environment Agency one meter lidar data. You can see. Uh, Again, it's digital terrain model, buildings and vegetation are stripped out, but you can see much more um, detail in, in the landscape. And this gives you a much better chance of accurately identifying the sites that fall within certain bounds. Um, so I'm really quickly going to run through the, the process. So we obtained uh, LiDAR surface data. Again, uh, you get uh, five times more information on the one meter post spacing, so it's much more accurate. Vertical accuracy is 10 to 15 centimetres. Um, the only downside with it is this is captured by the Environment Agency to identify flood risk in lowland areas, so it doesn't cover, doesn't give you complete coverage. But you can blend it with the radar data to give you total coverage. Um, really quickly, I'm just going to run through what we identified on this on this pilot. So um, sites below the one metre contour being affected by predicted sea level rise. Uh, in this pilot area, we identified two buildings uh, in Aberystwyth, uh, a bridge over a river, and uh, understandably the pit and, and the pavilion. Um, I'll come on to whether, what does that tell us? Are <coughs> these sites at risk anyway? You know, these are these pretty robust structures, but uh, we'll uh, 37 uh, historic environment record sites, 99 national monument record sites. 63 of which are wrecks, and this is reflecting a focus that we got on the maritime survey. But they're not all wrecks by any means, and, and um, they're also sort of um, you know, preserved, preserved forest remains, uh, historic peat cutting areas, fish traps, as the Sandwich already talked about. Um, but just to highlight the difference that the use of this data has made and the emphasis on a different um, uh, survey um, regime has made. In 2009, when we ran this process, for the whole of Wales, we identified 94 National Monument Record sites that fell within that zero to one metre category. This time, we've got 99 just in this pilot survey area. So we're getting much better information about the sites that may be at risk. Um, so that was the topographic data. We then work in partnership with other agencies, um, other world government agencies, such as Natural Resources Wales. And I think this is one of the key things is uh, that we've been exploring is the use of their data sets, their natural environment data sets, that, that offer far more detail uh, and they've got obviously a depth of knowledge that we don't have. But working in partnership with them, we're able to work quite smartly. Um, so the next thing we were looking at is slightly rather similar, <coughs> coast edge and foreshore, and then zero and one meter contour, but we brought in their coast edge and foreshore local biodiversity action plan data. Using that very uh, accurately modeled poly polygonal data, we can capture the sites that fall within this um, intertidal habitat. And it's slightly different. So, again, this time, scale of monuments. We pick up one scale of monument at, at Pillbox uh, in Aberystwyth. 
one listed building, the PM Pavilion again, uh, 27 XGR sites, and 52 National Monument record sites. So again, it's different data sets give you different information. You know, and what are we basing our assumptions on? Whose data are we modelling against? Um, moving away from the from the shoreline, although there aren't beach deposits submerged. Um, we also were looking at four categories, so the sites below uh, one metre, uh, coastal portal, peats, and sites at risk of flooding. So looking at peats, obviously we've already had some information this morning about, about peats. Natural resources whales have produced, bang up to date, very accurate um, peat mapping. So by working with them, we're able to access the, the most up-to-date, most accurate peat modelling um, available. Um, it's been categorised into, into deep peaty soils, modified peaty soils, shallow peaty soils, and soil with peat pockets. Um, and it's really, uh, what is most interesting is both the sites on the deep peat soil, which, as long as the deep peat soil, peat soil remains, we probably don't need to worry about too much, but the stuff that we've really got to worry about is the modified deep peat soil, because this is uh, peat areas that have lost the ability to regenerate themselves. The vegetation cover has changed to the extent that they don't perpetuate. Uh, so the light brown area here is an area that's not sustainable it's because of the change in vegetation. So um, it's hard to see the difference, but when you zoom in, you can see on the right, field on the right, it's peat producing, field on the left, due to drainage or uh, fertilization or whatever it might be, um, is no longer a peat producing uh, vegetation cover. We ran this again um, in, in the pilot area. 54 sites were identified on peat soils, three of which, Scotia Nature Monuments, were on uh, the modified peats that aren't supporting themselves. Um, HGR sites, 924 sites, 19 on the modified peat. National Monument record, 1,623 sites, and that reflects our focus on upland uh, archaeology, and 54 of those are on modified peats. So is this going to help us when we start thinking, well, so what? But this might help us when we're looking to target the action we're going to take or the records we want to enhance or whatever it might be. And lastly, the last category was um, flood plains and valley bottoms. Um, different zones as defined uh, by natural resources well. So you've got zone B, which are areas that are known to, to have flooded in the past, and zone C2, which are areas that don't have significant flood defence infrastructure and are likely to flood. Um, the green areas are those that are defended. And again, we went through identifying sites, so 18 sites uh, are at risk. One historic park and garden at risk, uh, 206 identified, but 965 uh, at risk. Um, and it's categorization, HERs, LMRs. So you can see, we're, we're just basically accruing lots of data sets, lots of sub data sets of data sets that are categorized in different ways. And I'll come on to what we're going to do about it in, in just a second. So um, we haven't just focused on the pilot area. Um, the ambition is to scale this up and do a pan Wales approach. Basically. So for all Wales, we, we've run this and um, haven't completed the, the, the running of it. but. Um, uh, in terms of scheduling monuments, there are 120 on peat type soils, 19 have been uh, on modified soils, so we probably want to target those. Uh, national monuments records, 1,219 of our sites are on uh, modified peat. And then you can do some other things as well when we're thinking about right, um, classification and uh, where we want to, may want to prioritise the work we do or run new projects or adapt projects that we're already running. Uh, you can bring in other data sets, such as historic landscape characterization or uh, natural resources Wales, it's uh, land map and historic landscape classification. So all the areas in red here are what they term as outstanding examples of historic landscape in Wales. Uh, by running some simple spatial analysis and bringing in different data sets, you can quite quickly target areas. So we've got the land map outstanding categorization. And then you've got the, um, again, natural environment data, but the sites of special scientific interest. So whether those cover less, they cover less here. The next stage would then be to say, okay, so which, where do the scheduling monuments fall on those? If we're concentrating on peak, on which are the ones on modified peak? And quite quickly, you go from a big list and quite a small list and a magical number to then, you know, how up to date are our records on those, those sites? 
Uh, a couple of things that occur when you start doing this as well is, is the accuracy of the data. So there's, there's a lovely fair ball again, which was actually where my, um, my in-laws came from. Funny that one, they subsequently divorced. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's fair ball, lovely fair ball. Um, the, um, this is the LIDAR data, the digital terrain model. It's, a, it's an automatic process that geomatics run for the Environment Agency to strip out the buildings and the vegetation. So when we're analysing and saying, OK, what falls within the zero and one metre contour, what we're actually using is a guess, is, an, is the result of an algorithm, because they take the buildings, strip them out, but you can see there are ghosts of buildings, there are weird anachronistic sort of heights in there. So it's the best we've got, but I don't think it's actually the best they could probably do. So a way to, to, to work with them in a, in a different way would probably do better. And finally, um, just, to, just to look ahead, uh, the ambition now is to um, continue this work, but to scale up the, from the study area to cover the whole of Wales, as we've already started doing. Also, you know, we're just, all we're saying is that these are the sites, but we don't, haven't done yet any analysis of, of what those sites are. Uh, what period, what site type, what vulnerability. You know. um, there are other things we could do very rapidly to further enhance just that spatial analysis element. Very rapidly we could bring in uh, slope, aspect, altitude and precipitation receipt to, to, to start thinking again, well what, what do we target more, which areas do we target more. Um, all of this we're doing um, with the purpose of informing the sectoral adaptation plan that, that, that Andrew explained. And um, perhaps not this year, but hopefully this year, you never know, uh, we'd like to make the results of all this process available online through an open web feature service. And then this, the results can be used by anyone, by universities, by local authorities, by whoever uh, would like to access it. That's that.